I'm Tom Allen. I'm an extension and research plant pathologist in Stoneville, Mississippi. Uh, and I'll run through this as fast as I possibly can to get us back on schedule because I think I can skip through a few of these things because they're not necessarily problematic uh, in some other states. Okay, uh, Mississippi is probably the unique situation of we actually suggest as a group of extension specialists through work that was done a little bit more than a decade ago that automatic foliar fungicide applications at that point in time with standalone strobe urns, which would be just for lack of better terms, headliner quadras. This is work that was done by Poston and his crew, like 02 to 04, I think, uh, looking at more than 42 trial locations. They had an automatic three plus bushel per acre response with an automatic R3, R4 fungicide application with six ounces of headliner quadras. Uh, a lot of that work then it evolved into looking at reduced rates, looking at four ounce applications, and some of that work suggests the same thing. You can look at yield with a four ounce application and it stays pretty static, whether it's headliner quarters, at least back in that, in that time frame, so more than 10 years ago. Now the interesting thing is 2015, fast forward a little bit, you have a tremendous shift in products and product availability from most of the chemical companies at this point. You've trended away from standalone strobe learns. Now you have mostly either two-way mode of actions, some new three-way mode of action products, uh, and you certainly have options to tank mix with some of the generics. So this is work we'll likely expand in 2016. Trent Irby and I did this three locations, and what I did this morning was just average those three locations. Don't squint too much to look at the overall numbers. I know they're small. I thought this was going to be a, a bigger room. Um, but looking at... Uh, uh, and Jan had some of this up there. Four ounces of quadrish and six ounces would be the regular applications of most farmers in Mississippi in high yield environments, which in our state's termed essentially continuous soybeans, early planted, and in irrigated situations. In most of those cases, I would say probably 50 to 60 percent of our farmers in Mississippi are automatically applying a fungicide product uh, of some active ingredient, either a standalone strobe or a premix at this point because finding some of those standalone uh, strobe alarm products is difficult. But just average across those, those three locations, and this was one in Washington County, one in Prentice, and one in Tunica County, uh, depending upon your active ingredients, uh, and that would be your standalone quadrus, your standalone uh, strobe alarm, quadrus plus topsin, and that's a 10 ounce rate of topsin because you get down in Louisiana, Topsin has been a pretty good product for something like Cercosper blight. So for an automatic application practice, we thought we'd throw that in there and see how it, how it looked, and it did look pretty good. Uh, compared to eight ounces of Quadris Top, which would be your labeled rate, uh, and then Preaxor D, which is a, which is a co-pack, that's uh, Preaxor plus Domark, um, that has caught on quite a bit um, throughout Mississippi and some other states uh, in the Mid-South. But Oh, and, and look, really don't squint at this. This will just give you an idea. There are a tremendous amount of new fungicide products available. And I'm sure that I have skipped one or two on this list uh, because I had to add like at least one or two more on there. And I know it is really small. And even my, hold on a minute. That's better. Okay, good. Uh, now you're getting some two-way products, well, new two-way products, new three-way products, and look, a lot of these products are available. I would not necessarily say have new active ingredients. A lot of them are reformulations uh, or different active ingredients uh, at different um, percent rates of some of those. Uh, so keep in mind, this, this list is going to get even more complex as we go forward, because as I understand it, there are at least two chemical companies if not in 2016, for the season, at the end of 2016, we'll have tetraconazole containing products, which would be the active ingredient in Domark. There are at least two more companies that will have a Domark type product that will either be with a strobe alarm uh, or a standalone product on its own. Uh, and we've looked at a lot of those in my program over the last few years. This is, I think, if this is not on the Mississippi Crop Situation blog, it will be at some point. Um, as I continue to update it because look keeping up with fungicide products right now is difficult um, There's always new ones coming out and this doesn't even include uh, all of the generics 
So, with that in mind, and really what has changed, at least from the standpoint of what we suggest as automatic fungicide applications, uh, and as farmers and as an extension specialist and a researcher, it's really important to know what variety you have in a field before you choose if you're going to make an automatic fungicide application or if you're going to make a fungicide application in response to a disease. Now, in the last few years, we've looked at an awful lot of, this is the frog eye fungus, an awful lot of frog eye leaf spot throughout the Mid-South uh, and predominantly in Mississippi. And if you look at the overall national map, this would be documented fungicide resistance within the frog eye leaf spot fungal population. Uh, I think 11 states, and there may be a 12th added here shortly, 11 states have documented fungicide resistance in over 172 counties or parishes. Now, I can speak pretty broadly as to what's going on in Mississippi. <coughs> we grow soybeans in something like 76, 77, or 78 of our 82 counties, depending upon the year. And we went crazy sampling for frog eye in 2014 because we didn't do that much in 2015. <coughs> Essentially, wherever we found soybeans or wherever we found frog eye, we grabbed a sample, ran it through the lab, ran the molecular tests on it. And essentially, if you grow soybeans in Mississippi and you have frog eye, it's resistant to strobe or and fungicides. So making an automatic either headline or quadrus or a comparable strobe or and fungicide application in response to frog eye is not going to be beneficial. And I've got some of that to show you, uh, some of that here if, as time permitting, of course. Okay. The one other thing I did want to talk about, and this is something I get a lot of telephone calls about this on an annual basis, and it's typically the question, okay, I had frog eye, I made a fungicide application, frog eye got worse. Why did it get worse? Well, if you look at this uh, figure, and this would be time of application and then seven days after that date, this is the untreated check in a test, okay? Observable frog eye rated on a zero to nine scale you would expect it to increase in the untreated check. Now the line that's in here is at 17 days because essentially that's when you would more or less expect that just about any fungicide product is going to wear off at that point in time. You're no longer going to expect efficacy from that product regardless of what it is at more or less 17 days even though I know that the, uh, typically some of those are 14 to 21 days. 17 is a good, a, good, uh, a good hard and fast rule just based on the environment we get in the mid-southern United States. If you throw on a bunch of fungicide products and disregard all those, but essentially they're standalone triazoles, there's a quadrus top in there, there's preaxor plus all the standalone triazoles, you can see that yes, fungicides do provide a benefit on frog eye leaf spot and you do get a reduction in disease over time, but by the time you get to about 45 days post-treatment and even when you start breaking after 17 days post-treatment, you're, you're looking at something that, yes, you've reduced frog eye a little bit, but it hasn't gone away. You're benefiting the plant by making a fungicide application because you're protecting leaf material that has not previously been infected. If it's already been infected, the disease isn't going to go away. So you'll get some benefit post-application because I typically, I get these calls all the time. Two weeks after application, I've got a lot more frog eye. Why do I have more frog eye? The fungicides do do a good job, but you're trying to overwhelm a system that mathematically is, is extremely complex because you have a lot of spores out there, uh, especially when you're looking at something that's frog eye susceptible. All right, because I only have a couple minutes left, um, we're going we're gonna to look at the 2015 stuff, but we'll look at this first. All right. If you were to make a standalone strobe learn application, regardless of timing, and this is made at V7, V7 uh, followed by an R2 application, uh, and then a V7, R2, and an R4. Regardless of how many times you make a standalone strobe learn application or at what rate, you get no benefit when it comes to yield. Now this is Armour DK4744, phenomenal variety. Great yielder, absolutely no resistance or tolerance to frog eye leaf spot at all. And you can see making some of these other applications at these timings, Proline at three ounces at R2, followed by Stratego yield at R4, you got an eight bushel per acre response. And then you got a 10 bushel per acre response, Domark followed by Headline. The hardest part as a plant pathologist is you can look at different locations and at some different locations, you'll still see a positive response from a standalone strobe alert. A lot of that is probably because 
the predominant shift in that population present in that field of the fungus is likely not all resistant to the shrub worm, but is likely moving in that direction. Um, and I should say Stunville, Starkville, uh, and it's Starkville, any of those locations that I'm showing 2014, 2015, it's been documented resistant to the struggle urns. Same type of situation in 2015, same variety, R3 application, quarter percent non-ionic surfactant and all of our trial work. Uh, and you can see good responses with some products, not nearly as good with others. Uh, in this test, even some of the standalone strobies at six ounces at R3 looked pretty good. I, I can't explain that. Um, not near as good as some of these other products. Uh, and this is grouped Strobe or Strobe plus insecticide, your triazole-based products, premixes, and then one down here at the end that's a copper-based product that's just not very good when it comes to, uh, to frog eye. Okay, the last thing I want to wrap up on would be phytotoxicity. <coughs> now, this is something that at least in Mississippi I get a tremendous number of telephone calls on a lot of questions about phytotoxicity and whether it's reducing yield and essentially phytotoxicity is something that's going to look very similar to something like sudden death syndrome or any of the other root associated issues uh, I did get at least one telephone call from a friend in Arkansas that saw some of this and don't be alarmed because my grad student played with his iPhone to kind of do a better job of making it highlight and stand out. Um, but with some products, and I won't define it, essentially it's basically a burn or something that appears like an injury following a fungicide application, and there are a lot of products present on the market that can result in some sort of phytotoxicity response. Um, this will give you just an idea. If it's something that's been in our program that we've actually sprayed and looked at in the field, we put it on the list because I do end up with some folks that call and say that they're seeing it with another product. And if I haven't seen it, then, then I'm not bulking it in on our list. Um, and really, I won't break it down to the ridiculous. But do know that, and this I think will be the last slide I show, there are varietal differences when it comes to phytotoxicity. And I can put this really simply. The last two to three years, we did Armor DK4744 in our trials in Stoneville. This past year, 2015, we went with Dynagro 37RY47. Genetically, it's the same variety. Okay. Interestingly enough, we ended up with some Phyto with some products in the Dynagro variety that we had not previously seen in the, in the Armor. Um, we did luck out this year. There was an OVT location outside of Leland where the farmer accidentally put eight ounces of Quadris top on and you could rate varieties and their response to that fungicide based on how much phyto was present uh, and this will just give you an idea of the 70 that's 70 or 80 of the 80 varieties at that location you can see 20% uh, of them had no phyto uh, and then from there you could break that down I used I just used a simple 0 to 9 scale where 0 was no phyto 9 was excessive phyto um, and there are some tremendous differences varietally, so keep that in mind because year to year that, uh, that can shift and, and result in some questions. And then um, I'll stick this last one up here for you all.